I can be speak, I'll be speaking on the treatment principles in open fractures. Now, my disclosure statement, being an Indian, a poor Indian, I have nothing to disclose. Now, when talking about open fractures, it suffices to say that the rate of infection is directly proportional to the extent of the soft tissue damage. International literature shows that it's less than 1% for tie duties. So the aim of treatment is to prevent infection. And this is achieved by converting an open fracture to a closed fracture as soon as possible, thus providing a conducive environment for uneventful fracture healing and regaining good pre-injury status and functions. Now, these are the key principles that one has to meticulously follow in order to achieve this aim. I will cover these as I proceed. Number one, complete evaluation. Now, the importance of complete evaluation can never be overstressed. It is recommended for all high energy injuries. Follow the ATLS protocols. Look for and manage, document the neurovascular status. Proceed with systemic antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis if required. Then document the size, contamination, and location of the wound. I always tell my juniors that it's a good habit of taking clinical photographs of the wounds before doing anything else to them. And then proceed for generous emergent irrigation. I will re-emphasize, follow the ADLS protocols. Save the patient before you attempt to save the limb. Your initial evaluation should answer these questions and then you should document them. What is the nature of the wound and the surrounding skin? And what is the neurovascular? Thereafter, cover the wound with a sterile dressing gently apply traction to realign the fracture and splint it. Always remember that after this particular maneuver, you should recheck the pulse, motor, and sense. At this stage, don't take any cultures. They are of no clinical significance. Always be cognizant of the fact that compartment syndromes can occur with open injuries due to severe crushing components. To recognize these can have disastrous consequences, not only for the patient as well. Now, we're all aware that the most commonly used classification system is the gustulose, which is naturally based on the wound size and not on the soft tissue injury and contamination. But when we talk about these fuller classification, we see that the grades of soft tissue injury correlates well with the infection and fracture healing. However, that there is high degree of subjectivity and low inter particular classification, often as low as 50%. And therefore, it is the recommendation that at the initial stage, don't go about classifying your fracture. That brings me to the Ganga Injury Severity Score, which the, the next speaker is going to be speaking on. It, and naturally, I will just mention it here. So when should you actually classify your? Well, it should be done in, after your primary wound care and the first debrima in the operation theater. The advantages of this, you would have a correct assessment of the extent of the soft tissue injury, viability, size of the skin defect, and the periosteal stripping. Number two, make antibiotics. Now, early systemic antibiotic administration to achieving your aim of preventing infection. This is well documented. Numerous studies have been carried on about this. A delay of months of instituting the primary dose of antibiotic is associated with this increased risk of infection, irrespective of the timing of surgery. Some authors have gone to the extent of actually advocating that a delay of most minutes is an independent risk factor for developing infection. Most acute infections are caused by pathogens that are acquired in the hospital. 
And most open fracture infections are caused by gram negremia and gram positive staphylococcus. Now, if we look at literature, we find that there are studies that say percent of infections are caused by organisms isolated in only 18% isolated operative culture. Another study that says that 92% open fracture infections were caused by bacteria acquired while the patient was in the hospital. This tells us two things. Initial cultures, if you were taking them, significance. And secondly, you should try to cover the wound as quickly as possible. The question that arises, which systemic and we start with? Well, there's no broad-based consensus on the use of different antibiotics. He tells us prompt administration and early surgery. So more important than the type of antibiotic is its prompt administration. Now, various studies have looked at the sensitivity and specificity of different biotics. They also analyzed their negative effects on an osteoblastic inhibition. Now, if we look at the different grades, there is no consensus to come out with a different regime. But all studies agree on only one aspect, and that three injuries, both gram-negative and gram-positive coverage is required. One other controversial question is, for how long should these be given? Well, studies have now clearly demonstrated no difference between giving them for one day to five days post your primary wound care. Number three, primary surgery and debridement. Now, the objectives of your initial surgical management should, number one, preservation of life and limb. Number two, good surgical wound care and debridement. Number three, definitive injury assessment. And number four, fracture station. Now, what about the six-hour rule? As Shakespeare would say, to be or not to be. The so-called six-hour rule guideline for dealing with open fractures. It was a doctrine that was hammered into our thick skulls during our residency days. It stipulates that to prevent infection, it should be fully managed within six hours. But numerous studies debunked it. No significant difference between before or six after surgery. What is important is how you do the debridement. All affected tissue plane should be explored, bone exposed. Look at the soft tissue stripping. Examine contamination. Remove all devitalized and contaminated tissue. Excise bone fragments. Now, at this point, I, however, would want to make a point, retain key bone fragments, especially of your articular surface. You may require serial debridements. The time interval between serial be between 24 to 48 hours. And importantly, for every institute an additional three days of antibiotic therapy. Now, another controversial topic, which is, when should the primary debrima be done? Now, these are quote, me quoting from literature. Timing to OR is probably less than the adequacy of debridement and the time to soft tissue coverage. Timing should debility, physiological stability of the patient and the assistance and personnel. Are no point in doing a debridement at the dead of the night when only the junior consultant or the junior are available. So in conclusion, I would like to say that debridement is not emergent. It is not required to be done within six hours, but it is urgent, should be done between 12 to 24 hours. So what is the role of irrigation? Simple answer. The solution to pollution is dilution. Depending on the severity of contamination, Ideally, we should be using between six to 10 liters of saline. Let's advocate the rule of the three. Type one injuries, three to six liters. Type three injuries, nine liters. Your choice. But whatever you want to wash it with, wash it more than what you want to wash it with. 
What is the role of pulsatile lavages in? Well, studies have shown that it actually has worse soft tissue cleaning and slows the bone and therefore is not recommended. What is the role of antibiotics in your irrigation fluid? Few reported cases of anaphylaxis, but that is, there are no actual benefits of using it and no proven benefits. What is the role of soaps in irrigation? They do emulsify and remove debris, can be used in gross contamination, otherwise no proven. So the level four evidence-based key recommendations would be First, wash out of highly contaminated wounds. Do it with soap solution. Thereafter, redrape it. And then repeat wash out of the clean wound with saline. If you are going to deal with wounds, then you may consider using soaps and antibiotics. Number four, local antibiotics. Now, local antibiotics provide high concentration within the wound, reduce side effects. They are heat stable and therefore beneficial. But then the answer is, which, for how long, and what are the proven advantages? Well, because they act as epistemic antibiotics, it has been shown that they do tend to increase the incidences of infection considerably, as shown in this review of more than 1,000 cases, where the author showed a 75% decrease in the infection rate. And this has now become the basis of their usage with bone grafts and bone semens and coated implants, extramedullary as well as intramedullary. Especially in large wounds, they decrease the dead space and also seal the wound from external contamination. Number five, wound closure. Now, again, a controversial topic. Timing has always been a controversy, but... Oh, and the earlier belief was that the open wound should be left open to prevent anaerobic conditions, facilitate drainage, allow repeat debris. But now we know that it's proven wrong. We now know that if we close the wounds early, then we have decreased usage of antibiotics, decreased contamination, and increase in over and no increase in overall infection. In fact, it decreases the infection rate. Quoting from a paper by Dr. Rajesh Agrin, when he showed, which was published in the JBJS, the debrima within 12 hours and followed by followed by primary skin clothes provided excellent results in 87% of the patients. Now, however, there are certain instances where primary closure should not be attempted. If you have gross contamination or farm-related freshwater immersion injuries, delay in institution of treatment or delay in institution of antibiotics or host or tissue viability is compromised. So when should we cover the wound? As soon as possible. If not immediately, as soon as possible. This will decrease the infection rate fivefold. And for any case, if you have to delay your, uh, your closure, please don't leave the wounds open. Use the PMMA beads or vacuum-assisted closure. Coming to the vacuum-assisted closures. Now, these have mechanically induced negative pressure because of using cell polyurethane foam dressings, which have even distribution of the negative pressure. They remove fluids from the extra extravascular spaces, reduce edema, increase microcirculation, and increase proliferation. Number six, fracture stabilization. Choice of stabilization would depend on the type of injury and type of and degree of contamination. External fixations are the easiest options available. Safest option if you don't know the status of how contaminated the wound are. But personally speaking, I think they're only temporarily until soft tissue stabilization takes place and we can change them to internal fixation. Now for type two injuries, we want to stabilize the fractures as early as possible, type two and type three injuries, because once we stabilize the fractures, it will provide an ideal environment for soft tissue healing, which is our goal till we can go in for definitive internal fixation. Now I know David would be speaking on internal fixation, 
but literature supports the use of in open shaft fractures if we have substantially well done debrima. No clear evidence between reamed and unreamed nailing, however, is present. So if you have early presenting wounds where you can achieve good coverage, reconstructable, then proceed for internal fixation and open injuries. If you have a delayed presenting, grossly comminuted one, use external fixation to buy time, let the soft tissues recover, and then change. So finally, in conclusion, follow principle-based evaluation, initiate antibiotics as soon as possible, do a thorough surgical debridement, don't leave it to your youngster, accurate assessment of severity of injury will give you an idea of the final outcome, and closure and stabilization should depend on the soft tissue and the fracture pattern. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.